Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Nir Shavid. I'm the CEO of uh, Neuromagic, and I'm uh, also a professor at MIT. And, uh, you know, this uh, talk is kind of a combination of, of my research, which essentially I'm going to tell you about my research in, in computational neurobiology, which essentially led me through my, my um, you know, my knowledge of multi-core uh, systems to come up with the technology behind uh, neural magic. And, um, and so, you know, what I'd like to do is kind of walk you through, um, you know, the history of, of my um, kind of engagement, both with, uh, both with uh, neurobiology and machine learning and, and kind of talk about where, how I see the, the progress of machine learning, hardware and software given uh, this history. And so, um, you know, I'm gonna start by having you look at this photo. You've already looked at it. Um, you'd be surprised to know that it takes you about one hundredth of a second to kind of identify that, you know, this, this is Mount Fuji, for those of you who know the Mount Fuji, right? So one hundredth of a second is very little time, okay? And still you manage to actually do this recognition. And how do you do that? Well, you do that with neural tissue, the stuff between your ears, right? This, you, we have this incredible... Uh, biological tool that we use to do this kind of uh, recognition. And what's going on, you know, in this neural tissue, right? Well, um, neural tissue is, right, is made up of essentially of neurons. A neuron is a cell that has, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor here, but uh, has a nucleus. Um, it has one part that's called the dendritic tree and another part that's called the axonal uh, tree, and it has an axon, which is this long protrusion. Uh, if this is the nucleus of the cell, then the axon is a very long protrusion, um, and at the end of it is also another axonal kind of uh, tree. And the, the way that, uh, you know, the way that uh, communication is done in neurons is through these connections, chemical connections in, in, in uh, mammalian brains called synapses. So the dendritic tree and the axonal tree have lots and lots of synapses on them. And what happens, right, is that signals are received, chemical signals are received at these synapses. Um, they create a kind of an electrical current through the uh, through the uh, dendritic tree. And then once this current reaches a certain, uh, uh, you know, kind of a collective uh, size, um, it's, you know, and it passes a threshold, then we actually have a firing of the current down the axon and then down the, uh, you know, axonal arbors until you reach the synapses at the other edge, and these synapses in turn send out chemical signals which cause the next neurons down the road to fire and so on. And the axon itself is covered with an insulating kind of structure called a myelin sheet, okay? And this kind of helps isolate the signal because axons actually uh, can go very long distances. For example, right, there are axons going from from your brain all the way to your toes. So, good, this is a neuron, right? And connectomics, I'm sorry, I have to go back here. Connectomics, the, the area of, of, of science that I'm engaged in, is essentially busy with mapping the connectivity of neural tissue. And we're gonna, we do that at the level of synapses so that we can see who is connected to whom, okay? And, and so what is this synapse if I, you know, this connection? Well, here's a little bit of what it looks like schematically, right? There are in the, in the axon at the, in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the synapse in the axon, you can see we have essentially these little vesicles filled with, with neurotransmitter, chemical 
things that actually allow, you know, uh, kind of when, when the vesicles open up, they allow the flow of these neurotransmitters that are then received on the receptors on the dendrite, which cause the electrical current to go down, um, you know, the other neuron. So that's a synapse, okay? And, you know, and so, you know, you have this brain, right, which is made up, you know, your, your brain is typically somewhere between, you know, 80 and 100 billion neurons, okay? Um, your cortex is about, well, it depends what the measurements are. Now people believe it's about 20 billion neurons. So, so a massive amount of, of neurons, okay? And, you know, we're kind of, you know, we're more than 100 years after um, the first time we, we actually tried, started to kind of look at, at brains at, uh, you know, at, in detail. And we still really don't have a very good understanding of how they work. And this has to do with many, many um, issues. But one of the big issues is size, right? The sheer size of this system. And so I want to just give you a feel of, of what it is that, that, you know, that has to be done by scientists trying to map the connectivity in a brain. So if this is your brain, right, um, you know, it's about 10 centimeters across. And we have these regions of planning and balance and vision. And you've probably seen photographs of what are called uh, functional MRI images of the brain, right? Where we see, you know, where, the, what, where there is activity based on the blood flow, right? So that's, that's at this uh, scale. But if we want to try to actually go and look at a region, okay, of our um, brain and do that, you know, uh, so let's go down to a region that's about 10x smaller, one centimeter, right? So what will we see there? Well, what we're going to see is gray matter and white matter. Gray matter are the cell bodies of neurons and white matter are axons that are going across your brain and are covered with, with the myelin sheets for insulation, okay? And if you go down another, you know, you pick another area and you go down 10x, okay? So what we see now at the millimeter level is essentially this is the, you know, this is the dendrite of a pyramidal neuron, okay? And you can see all of these right, are, are uh, you know, uh, dendrites. And here's the axon, it's going across somewhere in the brain, we don't know where. And if we go and pick a region that is again, you know, 10x smaller, okay, what will we see? Well, what we're going to see are what we call dendritic spines, okay? So dendritic spines are all these little connections here, and they are essentially where the synapses will occur. And if we go down another 10x, sorry, it's not moving. Uh, something wrong here. Yeah, if we go down another 10x, okay, what we will see is essentially a... Um, you know, is essentially a, uh, you know, this is an electron microscopy image of, you know, one uh, kind of region of a, of a dendritic tree. And so this, he, this part here, this is a slice through, um, you know, um, a, a dendritic spine. And on the other side of it, you can see an axonal terminal and you can see that these are the these tiny little things are the vesicles that I described that are full with neurotransmitter right and um, and then if you um, look at the whole thing the connection between these two there's a synaptic connection here right and essentially what is going to happen is as we described you know the the, the out of the vesicles we're going to have, uh, you know, uh, neurotransmitter flow into this dendritic spine, okay? So now, um, good, so we understand how this happens. We should note, right, that, 
that this thing, right, if you think about it, the resolution of an fMRI image, the one where you see all these kind of glowing images of the brain thinking, right, those are done at a resolution of about one millimeter. So every pixel is about a millimeter, okay? And this is 10,000 trillion times larger, okay, than the resolution in which we actually showed you this, this electron microscopy image of a synaptic connection, okay? So this is just kind of to get a feel of the scale of what we're talking about. Now, we've, we've been taking images of neurons for more than 100 years. In fact, one technique you know, for actually looking at neurons was uh, the Golgi technique available, the, the, invented by Camilo Golgi you know, in, the, in the 1900, 19th century, and, and you, know, you could see neurons using this technique. And in fact, a very famous uh, you know, um, um, neurobiologist um, you know, called uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal is famous for actually taking the Golgi technique and starting to map out neurons and mapping their connectivity, okay? And Golgi and Cajal were great uh, scientific enemies. They hated each other. Um, they won the Nobel Prize together in uh, 1901, I think. And, you know, and, 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 they, and, and what Golgi hated was Cajal's theory that these neurons were actually individual cells connected to one another and firing one into the other. Whereas Golgi and many others believe that actually the whole brain is one big connected spaghetti cell. Okay, and in fact, Golgi spent his whole, uh, you know, uh, Nobel Prize acceptance uh, lecture explaining why Cajal was wrong. Now, turns out Cajal was right. And in fact, these images that he drew of essentially neurons, you know, firing, you know, into other neurons along their axons turned out to be true. And it's kind of amazing that someone could you know, just by looking at these images, figure out that that was what was going on. It took, in fact, until the 1950s an electron microscopy to actually see that, that he was right. So the problem with these images that, that Cajal and Golgi created and many of the images that we have today with staining is that you don't get a real feel of the density of neural structure. You have to really see the synapses. And, and if you look at this image here, you know, between every two neurons that you see here, there are thousands and thousands of other neurons. And I want to kind of show you that a little bit. And how, how do we see this dense structure? Well, this is the field of connectomics in which I do research. So what we do is we take a, a sliver of brain, typically mouse brain or rat brain, and we put it on this microtome, this kind of device that goes up and down and cuts the slices of this brain on using a diamond knife, throws them into a bed of water and puts them on a tape, okay? And so we've got these slices of brain, these slivers of brain on tape, okay? And then what we do is, um, run them under an electron microscope. This is, uh, this is my colleague, Jeff Lichtman, with our uh, very powerful microscope. Uh, I mean, this picture is intended to show you how short Jeff is. Um, and so then we kind of take images of these slivers of brain. So here's an example of a, of a, of a piece of, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a disc on which we put these uh, stripes of brain, each one of these little things is essentially a slice through a mouse's brain. And it looks like this if you look at it, you know, through a light microscope. And then if you go deeper, right, you can actually take this thing, slice it, okay, let's, in this case, we slice it 10,000 times, okay, um, and, you know, and then you get essentially a kind of a block. If we could actually image everything that was in there, the 10,000 slices, if we image them, and if we can reconstruct them, then we will have a 100 terabyte block of brain, okay, completely 
uh, mapped out, all the connectivity in it. Okay, just so that you understand this sliver of brain, okay, which is like a grain of salt, right, is 100 terabytes. In fact, a cubic millimeter that would contain about, you know, 100,000 neurons, would contain about 100,000 neurons and about a billion synapses, okay, would be about two petabytes of, 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 of kind of imagery that we would have to go through, okay, to get a cubic millimeter. Now, Okay, so what are we going to do with these images? Well, what we do is we run machine learning algorithms to segment them. Here's an example of a segmentation of, a, of, a, uh, of neurons in order to do some dense reconstruction. We basically go slice after slice and we identify the neurons by color, okay? And Sorry about that. And what you get, what, what you do is, what you're trying to do is track these neurons. So we, we basically invent, this is me and my students. Uh, this is actually a program done by, uh, invented by a machine learning algorithm by one of my students, uh, my postdocs. And what you can see is it's a machine learning algorithm that actually tracks, you know, and actually an axonal uh, arbor going through many, many, many slices of uh, electron microscopy imagery. So we use machine learning algorithms to actually track down and reconstruct the structure of neural tissue. Okay, that's, that's kind of my research. And let me just move forward with this. Um, and what you can do if you actually do these reconstructions is actually get a really good view of what, you know, what the, um, you know, what the structure of neural tissue looks like. And here's an example of two um, dendrites, okay, a red one and a green one. And, you know, each one of these uh, little uh, bumps that you see here is, uh, you know, is, is a spine, right? And now I want to show you if we actually look at the reconstruction of this, so around every one of these dendrites are all these other dendrites, okay? So all these dendrites are sitting in the same little volume, right? And here are all the axons in this volume. And here are all the glia cells, the support cells in this volume. So the whole thing together is extremely dense, as you can see, right? And so our goal, right, is to do the reconstructions of, of such, you know, pieces of brain. And of course, what you see here is only a hundred thousandth of the hundred terabyte grain of salt that you saw, okay? So it's extremely dense, lots of lots of things going on here. Good. So, so this is my research, applying machine learning techniques to, uh, you know, the, pro, the, the game of trying to kind of, the scientific game of trying to uh, kind of reconstruct the connectivity graphs of neural tissue, okay? And on the way to do this, I've had to use both my expertise in, in, in uh, multi-core uh, parallel programming and expertise in machine learning to tackle the problems that we were facing. Now, this kind of got me really deeply into the machine learning space. And of course, that's how I start, uh, got to start Neural Magic, okay? And I wanna kind of try to give you a feel of how I think about this space, given my kind of dual expertise, right? One in connectomics and the other in uh, the other in, uh, in uh, multi-core programming, multi-core computing. Um, so as you all know, we kind of try, I mean, the origin of, of machine learning is essentially a mimicking, you know, whether true or not, of some kind of artificial neuron, okay? So, you know, we're kind of trying to build, you know, now, um, you know, a world that actually uses machine learning. And in this world, what seems to be happening is that we are kind of building what's called neuromorphic 
ML hardware. Now, I don't mean neuromorphic that we're mimicking exactly neurons, right? But there is this idea, right, that the problem of machine learning is a throughput computing problem. You've probably heard this before, right? It's throughput computing. And the hardware for ML is different from the sequential kind of uh, CPU-based uh, algorithms and hardware that we did before, right? And there are many, many companies trying to build this new massively parallel throughput hardware. NVIDIA's GPUs, Google's TPUs, Intel has an NP and now Habana. You know, there's over 70 startups making hardware for machine learning. And the, and the essence of this hardware, right, is to have, you know, this massive parallelism. Right, for example, a GPU, right, a typical modern GPU has like 5,000 cores and about 16 to 32 gigs of memory, right, high bandwidth memory. And what happens is you place the, the, the data and the model into the memory, right, and then the thousands of cores apply on the order of 100 teraops per second of compute to these, this model in order to enable us to run, you know, the machine learning algorithm. Now, you know, this is our vision. So massive parallelism is in hardware in order to solve this uh, computing problem. And of course, you know, Google's idea of a, of a, of a brain is the TPU pod, right? A hundred petaflops of machine learning power. So I connect multiple GPUs with very high bandwidth connections, and all of this is running in parallel, okay? So massive parallelism, massive throughput. Now, what I'd like to do is ask a few questions about this, and I'm gonna ask the questions from the point of view of somebody who does neurobiology and, 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 and ask, okay, if we're trying to mimic really what's going on in a brain, then are we on the right track? Is the hardware we're building, is the software we're building to run on it, are, is this the right direction, right? So I want to say some things about compute. So the human cortex has about 16 billion neurons, according to some counts, maybe a little bit more, right? And neuro, cortical neurons spike about 0.16 times per second. This is just from energy calculations, okay? And each neuron in cortex, each uh, pyramidal neuron in cortex and, and others also, about 7,000 synapses each, okay? Now, there are 7,000 synapses, but that doesn't mean that each synapse is connecting, you know, each synapse is connecting to a separate neuron. In fact, right, um, you know, connectomics can help us figure out how many neurons probably each, each uh, cortical neuron is connected to. So here's an example of an image by Bobby Kasturi from uh, Jeff Lichtman's lab that shows, you know, in green you see a, uh, you see a dendritic uh, arbor, and in blue you see an axon, and you can see that this axon in this tiny little piece of brain is, as it passes by, right, as it passes by this dendrite, is connecting to it in five different places, okay? So what we conclude from that, I'm sorry, what we conclude from that is really that, you know, the number is not of neurons that each other, that each neuron is connected to in cortex is not 7,000, probably not even 700, probably more like 70, okay? But I'm just going to use 700 as the number. So if I use 700 as the number, and I want to see how many operations would this be computing if I model the, bi the biological neuron in the same way that I model the, um, you know, the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, artificial neuron. That is, you know, a collection of weights connecting to other neurons, right? And so what you get is, you know, about 16 billion times 0 0.016 times 700 is about 2 trillion operations per second, okay? 2 trillion operations per second, um, you know, is, you know, essentially less than, a, than an iPhone. An iPhone can generate about 5 trillion operations per second, okay? So we're talking about 
not that much compute. Okay? So in, if you think about this versus the TPU pod, the cortex is five to six orders of magnitude less compute than the TPU pod. Let's say that we're going to do image recognition. Okay? So a typical image that we show a neural network is 224 by 224, right? Which is about half a million pixels, right? And a network like ResNet, for example, takes about 20 to 30 billion operations to compute on this popular, uh, you know, on, the, on this kind of an image. Like say that was the image of Mount Fuji, okay? So the image of Mount Fuji, 224 by 224, and that, that's about uh, you know, half a million pixels, 20 to 30 billion ops. Now, the human iris has about 100 million pixels. So it's 2,000 X more pixels, right? And you know, so a neural network, okay, you know, running on that size of, of an image, right, would take about 40 trillion operations, okay? And so we recognize an image in about 13 milliseconds, like a hundredth of a second, okay? So even if we use the whole cortex, to, you know, all the compute in the cortex to just recognize that image, which is obviously not true, then 2 trillion times 0.13 is about 20 billion operations per image, okay? So we're doing about 20 billion operations to recognize something, right? So that's about three to four orders of magnitude um, more efficient than what, you know, a brain is, is three to four orders of magnitude more efficient than what you would get from a, uh, you know, a modern, um, you know, machine learning algorithm running on a GPU. Good. So let's talk about memory. We talked about compute. Let's talk about memory. So Human cortex, about 300 trillion synapses. What's the size of the graph, the connectivity graph, when you have 300 trillion synapses? That is, neurons have 300 trillion connections between them, okay? Well, it's about 1.2 petabyte, okay? So 1.2 petabyte is what I need to represent this graph, okay? What's the typical memory of a GPU or a TPU? About 16, 32 gigs, right? So if you think about it, like, right, this is really small. A desktop can have 1.4 terabytes. Any desktop you buy today will probably be able to hold a, a terabyte of memory. Okay, so what this tells us is the memory size, right, of our brain is about four to five orders of magnitude, you know, um, bigger than, than the, what, what's available in, GP, in a typical GPU and, and in the you know, TPU pod, okay? So with that in mind, what is going on here? So I showed you the amount of compute that I have, which is small. I showed you the size of the memory, which is huge, right? So what's really going on here is if I want to think about, you know, emulating what I do in my brain in silicon, right? Then think about what we're building. What we're building is, you know, a, devices with thousands of cores and very small memory, right? So kind of a petaflop of compute on, you know, a cell phone of memory. But what I want, what I really want is about a cell phone of compute on a petabyte of memory, right? not a petabyte of compute on a cell phone of memory. So I'm really far away. We're going in the opposite direction of what we actually probably need to do in order to mimic what's going on in the brain. And, you know, even if, you know, even if the truth is, is in the middle, it's still not what we're doing right now. And why are we doing this? Why are we building something that we kind of, um, you know, is not what we probably need. Well, it's because we really don't know what we need. We don't know what the graph looks like, okay? We really don't understand this very, very sparse computation in the brain. So the brain is extremely dense, okay, in terms of layout in the inside, right? But the, the fiction here is that 
the actual connectivity inside it is very minimal, and the actual amount of activity is very minimal, okay? So it looks like this massively dense connected thing like a GPU, but what it really is is very little compute and very sparse connectivity. So, okay, so we don't know the graph, so that's what we're building. And by the way, I just want to say, this is typical of, this is typical of computer science, okay? Whenever in computer science there is a new area, a new area of, of computing, the first thing we do is we throw hardware at it before we understand the algorithms, okay? And, and, and you, if, you think about, if you think about LISP, which is the language, the original language of artificial intelligence, when LISP showed up, the first thing people did was build LISP machines in hardware because we didn't believe we could do car and cooter on on a, on a regular, a typical CPU. And, you know, in the networking space, right? Once upon a time in a, in a networking data center, you had all kinds of accelerators to handle traffic. Now we just do it with CPUs. So this phenomena is a known phenomena, okay? And in machine learning, it's the same kind of thing. But we're learning, okay? We're learning what the graphs need to look like. So for example, here is a paper from May 2019 by Google. Um, some of you have, may have heard of Efficientnets. These are new types of networks that are significantly more efficient, you know, in terms of their compute um, than what we have known before. So, for example, right here is the here is the kind of the arc of of uh, existing known algorithms. I'm talking, uh, you know, the the x-axis is is the number of parameters in millions. And this is the accuracy, okay? The y-axis is the accuracy. And what you can see is that as I try to improve accuracy, I'm going into the, you know, hundreds of millions of, um, you know, of neurons, right? And uh, of parameters. And, and what you see here in efficient nets, right, is that actually I can do a lot better. So, for example, efficient at B0, which is the size of mobile net, can get the accuracy of ResNet. And efficient, and if, and, uh, you know, an efficient net, uh, uh, you know, B4, which is the size of ResNet, can get the accuracy of Amoeba net. Okay, so, so this is kind of where we're going. We're understanding better how to actually work out, right, the structure of these networks so that they require less compute. Now, here are some numbers. These are numbers, you know, on AWS using Neural Magic, our, our company's uh, runtime. So what you can see, you know, is, you know, this, these are the numbers running efficient at uh, B0, that is the accuracy of ResNet. You can see this is on AWS because it's easy to kind of get a feel of the total cost of something if you run it on AWS. They just give you all the CapEx, DevEx, and OpEx in one shot. So you can see that essentially for inference, batch size one, you know, this is a V100 GPU and a four core CPU will do the same kind of thing. And if you want throughput with batch 64, which is really good for the GPU, right, then a 24 core, you know, will deliver the same kind of performance. And in fact, if you use the same amount of money to buy nine times four cores, you'll be 2x of that, okay? Um, if you look at efficient at B4, which is a bigger network, then you need a 24 core to match the V100 batch size one, and you need a 24, you know, a 24 core is, you know, still in the ballpark of the V100 um, at batch size 64. Okay, so you can, what, what, what you can see here is that when these network, there are these networks that are just, you know, re really highly efficient, you can get really good numbers on, on uh, you know, on a commodity CPU, you don't really need a GPU for them, okay? Now, now the question is, you know, okay, so if this is true, then, then what is the future of, of neural hardware and software, okay? So what I'd like to say is as follows. Um, so first we need to understand, to understand how we got, okay, to the GPUs, right? We have to understand whether we believe in this thesis, right, that you know, that essentially you need this massive parallelism 
you know, in order to actually mimic what the computation of the brain is. And the first thing I want to say is, look, why is it, why is it that brains, right, uh, um, have this massive parallelism? Why do I have, you know, so much parallelism in my brain? Well, if I wanted to do a billion operations, okay, with very slow chemical, you know, devices like the neurons are, okay, then I need a billion of them to get a billion instructions per second. Okay, I need a billion running in parallel. But if I'm running on a modern CPU, I can get 10 billion instructions, right, per second out of the silicon. I don't need massive parallelism for it, okay? So in, in some sense, I'm saying, look, it's all Turing computable, flops or flops or flops. So what we really wanna do is just use the flops and we don't have to necessarily have them in parallel. Um, let me just see, there's a question here. Um, so the question, I'm going to postpone this uh, question for later. Someone asked, do we have any TPU, IPU, FPGA um, variants with the same comparison with Neuromagic's technology running on them? And the answer is, is yes, but let's talk about that later. So the answer is yes, we, we definitely have comparisons to all these other uh, technologies. So, so let me continue. So, so I'm saying silicon doesn't need to look like a brain to do what a brain does. We just need to know the algorithm. We need to know how to reproduce the function, okay? Now, but we can learn from neural tissue. Neural tissue, we can, what we can learn is that neural tissue is sparse and neural tissue has locality of reference, okay? These are the two properties of neural tissue, not the flops, but the sparsity and the locality of reference that we can take with us. What are, by the way, those who don't know, right, when I say locality of reference, I mean, when I use something, how fast do I use it again? How close, you know, what happens in a neuron is, right, that when a neuron fires, all the next neurons, next, you know, that are gonna follow from him are just connected to him and just immediately get that, connection. So if I was doing this in a, in a CPU, for example, then the moment I actually computed something, you know, using some weight, then the, uh, the output would be available to the other processors. That's what I mean by locality of reference. Okay. So can we mimic sparsity and locality of reference, um, you know, in hardware? Okay. The answer is yes. And today, the best way we can do this is on a CPU. Okay. So let me explain to you, okay, how you do this on a CPU, okay? Because all of us are kind of already sold on the Kool-Aid that you have to have a GPU to run machine learning efficiently, okay? So I wanna kind of try to show you how you can do this without running into the same problem, okay? And, and this is what Neural Magic does really, okay? So on your, on your left is a, is a kind of a schematic uh, example of a, of a GPU with thousands of cores and tiny caches. And here's a neural network that I'm gonna run on it, okay? And on the right is a CPU with few cores, more powerful, um, having, uh, you know, uh, vector instructions and having very large caches, and this is important. So while the GPU has thousands of cores with tiny caches, the CPU has large, uh, has fewer cores with very large caches. Now, the GPU also has incredible bandwidth to memory, and the CPU has kind of relatively slow bandwidth to memory. So these are the things, right, that we try, want to try to keep in mind. And so what happens is the, 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 the big explosion in using GPUs happened because people understood right, that you can execute a neural network efficiently layer by layer through the GPU. So what you do is, right, you bring in a layer and you can apply massive parallelism to this layer on the thousands of cores of the GPU. And then you can, you know, you read it in, compute, write it out, and you do that extremely fast because the GPU has incredible bandwidth to memory. And you go through the layers of the network one after the other like this, and you get fantastic performance, okay? That's the GPU. Now, 
If you do the same thing on a CPU, which is your typical execution on a CPU, then you're gonna run into trouble, okay? This does not work well, okay? First of all, the, you know, the, there's a lot of compute missing. And the second thing is that, you know, your, your memory bandwidth is much lower, okay? So you can't bring things in and out like that very easily and you, and you have too much compute. But luckily, you know, we can learn things from the brain, okay? So the first thing we can learn is that you can prune the network, sparsify it, and actually preserve accuracy still, okay? And when you do that, okay, what you get is an incredibly lower amount of compute, okay? You can prune a neural network, you can prune, prune networks to 80 or 90% very easily, okay? And so now you have much less compute. But now you have another problem. You've reduced the compute, but you still have the memory bottleneck. And now because you have less compute, this is even more memory bound, okay? So here comes the second trick. And this is a technology that Neural Magic uh, invented, um, you know, where what we do is essentially, we actually execute the neural network, not layer by layer, but actually depth wise, we have a way of executing the neural network so that each, you know, pieces of the neural network are running inside the cache of the large cache of a CPU through the network. And by doing that, you don't have to read and write back from memory. And that gives you an incredible way of overcoming the limitations that CPUs have. So if you apply these two techniques, if you sparsify and you use neural magic's um, technology, which we call tensor column technology, then boom, you can actually get GPU speeds, okay? And here's an example, ResNet 50, 87.5% sparsity. And again, this is on AWS. So this is the V100 GPU, the 24 core CPU, batch size one, you can see we can beat it. And this is the, the V100, and this is the 24 core, and this is a nine times four, um, four core, same price. You can see that we're doing significantly better on a commodity Intel CPU. And um, yeah. So this is an example of what, you, what neural magic technology can do. And these numbers, by the way, are kind of old numbers. Um, if, you go, if you actually uh, contact us, we can give you uh, latest numbers, which are, um, you know, for ResNet, for example, they're almost two X what you see here. Um, good. So, oh, actually I have some numbers I forgot. <laughs> okay, this is an example, even this is old. But um, this is, for example, ResNet at 600 now, okay? Um, this is a comparison to um, Intel's, uh, you know, Intel's uh, TensorFlow using MKL uh, DNN. This is, uh, you know, this is OpenVINO, and this is Neural Magic, and this is the T4 GPU. This is NVIDIA's, um, you know, inference GPU. So you can see that we really um, kind of are, are seriously competitive on a commodity Intel CPU uh, compared to, uh, you know, compared to, uh, 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 you know, both the GPU and other uh, CPU technologies. And here is the same example on 24 core uh, AMD CPU. So it's not just the Intel CPU, also AMD CPUs uh, get the same kind of uh, uh, benefits. Okay. Um, and yeah, and, um, and when you increase the, you know, you can really increase the batch size. When you increase the batch size enough, what you can see here is that the performance of the CPU algorithms continues to improve, but you notice that I don't have any GPU numbers here for the very large SSD mobile net, ResNet SSD and VGG19, because at 40, 480 batch size, okay, they just blow out of the GPU memory. Cool. So, 
So what is the future of neural hardware, okay? Well, today, as I said, you can use CPUs, large caches and cache hierarchy to run neural networks at GPU speeds, just contact neural magic and you'll find out all about it. And in the future, okay, it's not that we can't make better hardware, we can, okay? For example, right, the thing that I would do, right, if I, if I actually had to design a device that would actually be a, fit, a, a device fitting for mimicking the behavior of a brain is to actually what I would call a, a prefetched brain. So I would change actually the, you know, modern processors, they prefetch data from memory, right? So that when you come to compute on them, they're available there. And a modern prefetcher prefetches as if what I have, the data I have is in an array, right? For every, every time that I work on a certain, um, you know, um, piece of memory, I'm fetching the next piece of memory that would be used if this was an array layout. Okay, so one thing I could do is I could modify the way CPUs access memory to be more graph-like, to be based on a graph. And that would, for example, help us to get better performance in mimicking brain-like compute on CPUs or on devices that look like CPUs. And by the way, there are efforts like that. So there is a, there is a company, I think they're called Neuroblade. They are a company that works with Samsung. And what they are doing is they're actually using the, the, um, the controllers, the memory controllers of, of, uh, of a regular commodity uh, memory. They're changing them so that you can actually run the neural network compute next to the memory. So that's in a, a way to save all this kind of overhead and compute right directly on the memory. So those are kind of the ideas that I think might actually work. Um, cool. And of course, the final thing is we can better understand the algorithm. If we really know the algorithm, then we can come up with better and better and better algorithms. You know, it's typical right, that if you can get 10x or 15x by using hardware, you can get nine orders of magnitude, you know, improvement in software, okay? Software is incredibly inefficient. And so for any advance that you can get by doing hardware, you can probably get a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, advance using algorithms and using software. And so that's really another place where I think, uh, the combination of understanding the algorithms and writing new, new, new designs of machine learning algorithms will greatly help us. So this brings me to neural magic. So I said, look, okay, great. Neural magic actually, what we do is we run GP, you know, we run uh, machine learning algorithms speeds on commodity, um, you know, hardware. What does this give you beyond just, okay, Nir, you've proved it. So, you know, you can do on CPUs what you can do on GPUs, great. Well, the issue is that, you know, we, 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 we started the whole thing, we, we started the whole idea of using GPUs because we couldn't make CPUs do what, you know, they weren't good enough to run machine learning. But if they are, right, then what, they, what, what running on a CPU does is it removes the cost, it removes the complexity, and it removes the, you know, all the limitations that you get by having to have the special hardware in your data center. And when you sell software, you need to, you know, you need to actually uh, ask the client to have the, you know, the, the hardware to run it and so on. So you can get GPU class performance without the GPU. Neural Magic delivers our software in a you know, containerized scale out way. And we allow big inputs, big models because CPUs have a large amount of memory and there's no problem doing big things. And so if you wanna, uh, you know, if you, we're gonna do some Q and A now, but if people wanna um, know more about us, right, then please go to our uh, webpage and, and uh, and take a look at our products and take a look at the, you know, our resources. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna just uh, open things for um, Q and A. And I think I have a couple of questions. Um, so let me try to um, 
answer those questions. Um, so the first question is, by executing the way you mentioned on CPU, is accuracy impacted? Also, aren't the layers dependent on each other? How could processing them in this way work logically and also for the correctness of the final layers? Okay, so I'll start with the second one. That's why we're called neural magic. Well, more seriously, um, yes, you can. So in fact, there are dependencies, but the trick, the algorithmic trick, is how to actually do this, how to execute depth-wise despite the fact that there are dependencies, okay? Um, and then the question, the other part of the question was, is accuracy impacted, okay? So, you know, pruning is a, no, a well-known technique, okay? And um, it's really a growing area of research in, in machine learning, um, you know, so, the networks that, that I showed you, the pruning that I showed you, and the pruning that you can do with neural magic, you can prune things to 99% accuracy. So less than 1% loss of accuracy. So that's our standard, really. Now, of course, you could get more sparsity and more performance by going below 99% accuracy. But I think the golden standard for us is that you preserve 99% of your accuracy, okay? So that's to answer that question. Um, the next question is, uh, the performance numbers were on using the Neural Magic Inference Engine software, not on Neural Magic hardware, right? Yes, of course. You use a commodity Intel or AMD CPU. This is all just running on the machines you have. It's just take a CPU and run there. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the answer to that. Um, any other questions? Um, let me see. Yes. May you comment on quantum computing in reference to pruning? Is quantum computing is the ultimate solution for extremely complicated problems? Um, thanks for that question. So quantum computing is a kind of orthogonal, I think, in my mind, to, uh, to deep learning. So if you will, right, what happens, what happens, with, what happens with deep learning is what we're doing is, is essentially we're solving an optimization problem by approximating it. So we're doing an approximation of the solution, okay? Quantum computing is actually designed to kind of brute force and do the, you know, go through all the possibilities. So, right, so if you think about this like in, in, in solving a problem, the problem of, of scheduling, let's say scheduling jobs in a calendar, right, or people in a calendar, then, you know, the, you know, the machine learning algorithm will find a reasonably good solution quickly. Okay, whereas the quantum computer will probably find the optimal best solution quickly. Okay, and the quickly here, right, is the difference between the quicklies is that quantum computing is still very hard, whereas uh, machine learning is, uh, is today very easy. And so um, in the future, can we use quantum computers to solve some of the problems we use ML for? Sure. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to see that. Now, um, the question, the next question is, does neural magic work for training? So training is on our schedule, but we have not started to provide training solutions yet. Um, but we have the technology, um, you know, and we're going to do it. Um, what makes the graph so special? Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. I'm, I'm assuming that you mean what makes the, the, the brain graph so special? And we are trying to answer that question. We're really trying to understand what is it about the connectivity, you know, the graph in the brain that makes, that actually delivers, you know, the kind of, um, you know, speed and accuracy that we see. And we don't know the answer to that. Um, 
The next question is, Neural Magic does not sell hardware, right? Or are there plans to build a C a near the CPU memory? No, Neural Magic does not sell hardware. Our belief is that you can use your commodity hardware to do this. You just need to use our algorithms. Um, next question is, does your software work on ARM cores? Any plan for edge inference? So the answer is, there are plans, but they are long-term plans. So right now we don't do ARM, and part of the reason that we don't do ARM is the support for AVX instructions, for vector instructions. So our, as ARM adds vector instructions to their cores, we probably will move to do ARM also. Um, the next question is, do the graphs need to be converted to be able to use Neural Magic Inference Engine? If so, are there any limitations on the kind of models that bit can be converted? So Neural Magic is about to come out with, with a tool which we call Sparsify, and Sparsify actually allows you to do this, allows you to actually do the pruning so that you can run the sparse graph. Um, uh, the next question is, if I recall correctly, the brain is tilde four orders of magnitude more efficient than ML. It seems like Neural Magic closes the gap by one order of magnitude. Are the next steps you mentioned enough to close the other three orders? So that's a really beautiful observation. It's true, right? We do not know the algorithm. And the way to close the gap is really, I think, a, a, a question for both neurobiologists and people developing ML algorithms. I think that, you know, we're on our way and things are getting better and better. We're kind of you know, both, it's, it's as if there are two evolutionary paths, separate evolutionary paths, right? One is our brain, and we are trying to understand what happened along that evolutionary path. And at the same time, there is, you know, artificial neural networks, which are kind of improving in, in, in their capabilities, right? And I think, you know, it's, it's very hard to judge when a breakthrough will happen, but I'm, I'm, sh I'm, I'm pretty sure that our brains don't do you know, stochastic gradient descent to actually train. And so clearly there is another algorithm and we just need to discover it, okay? Um, next question is, would neural magic be way more powerful if they ran on GPUs instead of commodity CPUs? Um, so the answer is no. So the, if, you, if you kind of understood the, the way that I explained it, the technology that neural magic invented is actually a way of utilizing the fact that CPUs have very large caches and utilizing the fact that CPUs have very large memories. What we want to enable is a world where you can actually do very large models inside the CPU's memory. Right now, if you want to run a very large network like GPT-3, right, then you start to run into problems on most GPUs because the, 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 net, the network itself is too big to fit, even in inference, okay? And so this is a kind of a path that is bound to, to run into trouble. And so the solution is to have devices that have a lot of memory. That's the CPU. So our techniques don't work on GPUs because they have tiny caches. Okay, and they are actually fit to work on CPUs that have very large memories. Um, the next question is, can you comment on the effect of your, appro appro of your approach need for computing clusters rented by the minute or hour versus running on hardware that is owned on site? So, you know, we run in a, in a, in a container, you can run it on site, you can run it on, in the cloud, it is really, there's no real uh, difference, um, you know, so there is no real difference in effect, if you will, right? As long as, uh, you know, Kubernetes is supported, we can run it. Um, and uh, the next question, hi, Remco, thanks for the question. Um, great presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is, is the comparison between Brain and silicon in terms of flops, et cetera, fair. I mean, brains do not multiply ad operations. They work by, with volt, voltage built up and time-dependent decays. 
Great. So, so here's the thing. What I was doing, right, is the back of the envelope calculation that is just based on the same kind of, um, call it, uh, intellectual idea behind con convolutional neural networks, right? The way we model a convolutional neural network neuron, right, is assuming that there's a set of weights and what I do is, is uh, kind of, uh, you know, I add and I, then I decide if it passes a, you know, a, a threshold I fire it or whatever you want to call it, or I just um, kind of do additions and convolutions. Now, is this a fair way to, to, to uh, capture what's going on in a neuron, in a real live neuron? We don't really know, okay? But I think that uh, I will push back and say that the other direction of thinking that what's going on in a neuron is way beyond just a kind of combination of weight and firing, right, is also kind of problematic. Um, and so I uh, clearly my calculations are very, very kind of back of the envelope and not, you know, not trying to really mimic the real world, but I think they give us a feel, right? They give us a feel because they give us a feel of the sparsity of the brain compute really and they give us a feel of the sparsity of the ba of the brain graph and they give us a feel of the size of this graph and i think those are the things i want you to go home with in terms of magnitudes of what's going on um so the next question um is how do you define 99 percent accuracy what kind of accuracy is worth preserving at 99 percent so you know um it's Think of it like this, um, <clears throat> a technique that people use right now um, in, in, um, in machine learning, right, is what's called quantization, right? I take a model and it's FP32 and I transfer it to eight or 16 bits and I lose accuracy, right? And, and, and so this process, right, of, of, of quantizing something causes you to lose accuracy. People are willing to tolerate this loss for the tilde 4x speed up that they get from doing quantization, okay? So it's the same thing for neural magic, right? I think the accuracies that we want to preserve are of a similar uh, caliber to the ones that people get from quantization. Um, I hope that answers that. Um, the next question is, in brains, isn't the sparsification of the graph how learning takes place, not some kind of waiting? In other words, could backpropagation be a dead end? Um, I think the jury is out on whether sparsification of the graph is how learning takes place. In fact, what happens, right, typically in a brain is that when you are a child, like the human brain, right, until age two, you're adding synapses, and from age two, there's a massive loss of synapses, then, uh, uh, you know, at teenage age, there's probably another addition of, syn of synapses and then another pruning process. Now, so, and in the meantime, right, in the meantime, you're still adding and, and, and taking out synapses. This happens all the time throughout your life. So, so I don't think that sparsification is necessarily, um, you know, a learning, uh, part of the learning. It may be you know, it may be that it's part of the learning process, but it's definitely not all the learning process, okay? And so um, we clearly need to try to understand this, okay? We clearly need to try to understand this. Um, I would say that maybe you want to think about maybe sparsification is not necessarily, you know, in brains. Maybe it's not about learning, but actually it is about efficiency, Maybe what we're doing at some point is just cleaning out, you know, what is not necessary, right? Rather than actually uh, consolidating a learning process, right? So let me go on to the next question. Um, hello, I'm a grad student. How cost flexible is neural magic for a student to afford? Well, we provide inference right now. When we do training, look, we're going to probably be allowing, providing a whole bunch of academic things for free. Um, next question is, um, do neurons work in binary? Good question, I don't know. 
Um, and uh, final question is, what are your thoughts on the heterogeneous compute solutions, many cores with coherent memory, um, e.g. APUs, GPUs with CAPI? Um, I think all of these efforts are great. I think that clearly we need to um, continuously move, you know, our, um, you know, we need to improve this. It, it is the, you know, the, the kind of, um, the kind of compute that GPUs provide right now has a lot of drawbacks. Okay. So anything we can do to improve them will help definitely in training and in the cases where they are used for, um, you know, where they're used for, um, inference also. Examples of this are, for example, moving data into GPUs is problematic. You know, if we could improve that path, that would be great, right? Um, GPUs are terrible at sequential tasks, right? So they can't really do compression very well. Compression is a sequential task, right? And we, we would love to compress things in order to allow us to, to move data faster and data movement is really key to performance. So yes, um, I am all for heterogeneous kind of com compute solutions, okay, that kind of take, uh, you know, and try to improve uh, over just uh, the existing hardware that we have. Um, so I think with that, I finished the, the Q&A and I wanted to thank everybody for attending. Thank <laughs> you.